just by introduction as we start getting uh, going now, uh, just a, an awareness who Dr. Shalala is for those of us who do not know. Dr. Shalala is a triple threat. Uh, she was the president of the University of Miami before uh, Dr. Frank. Uh, by the way, she was also the chancellor and president of also Hunter College in New York and also the University of Wisconsin-Madison before that. She is also, and perhaps uh, even more importantly for the purpose of what we're going to be talking, she's currently a congresswoman representing our area, and uh, she is also the former Secretary of Health and Human Services, overseeing all healthcare aspects of our country, the longest serving um, Secretary of Health and Human Services in the history of the United States. And uh, so we're most fortunate. Also, I have to say that Dr. Shalala is a friend, a colleague, and perhaps most importantly for me, a mentor. So we are so appreciative for uh, Dr. Shalala to be on with us. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Shalala. Well, it's been an extraordinary period in, a, in American uh, health history um, with this pandemic. I've been working directly on a series of bills uh, both healthcare bills as well as economic bills, because obviously the economic system uh, in the United States is collapsing. We're going into a deep recession, and the bill that will be voted on today in the Senate, which the Democrats have been working with the uh, Republicans on, will be bipartisan, and it will make an effort to prop up the economy, but more and more important, just give people their salaries back. Uh, which they're obviously losing in South Florida and across the country. Um, so it's a big economic investment, but basically to put money in people's pockets in a wide variety of ways. On the health side, uh, this new bill, and we've been investing in the healthcare system through the other two bills. This new bill gives money directly to the hospitals and actually pays for supplies uh, that they need. Um, and it... Um, uh, make certain um, uh, that uh, people are not hoarding uh, materials. It makes deep investments in the NIH and in the possibility of clinical trials in the FDA. Uh, but it's a combination of an economic uh, package as well as a healthcare package. Uh, we are literally spending $2 trillion this week of U.S. taxpayers' money to both prop up the economy uh, with a stimulus package and at the same time save the healthcare system and allow it uh, uh, to expand uh, the way it must in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we have, uh, and that's, uh, that's really what Congress has been working on. Uh, let me tell you what my concerns are. When you're in the middle of a very difficult um, situation like this, uh, when you're in the middle of an outbreak or a pandemic, you need very clear leadership, not simply from the President of the United States, but also from governors and from um, uh, mayors as well. And we have known for a long time in public health that we've underfunded the system. In the 1990s, we took a very careful look at the possibility of a pan pandemic. In fact, we actually did a desktop exercise on the possibility of a flu pandemic um, uh, in the United States and found all sorts of gaps in our healthcare system, many of which we're now seeing. And we made some corrections, but clearly not enough because we just couldn't get anyone to listen to us. But fundamentally, you need clear leadership that listens to the scientists, and that's what all of us have been beating on. Um, obviously, um, the leaders of NIH and of CDC and of FDA have been front and center, as well as the, uh, the public health people like the Surgeon General. But the fact that the President of the United States is making things up as he's going along has totally confused the public, and it's exactly what you don't want to see. You want to see, see a president that reflects the science. Now, let me also be clear that as good as I think Tony Fauci is, or Ann Shukat, the number two at the, the CDC, or Steve Hahn at the FDA, um, 
or the surgeon, uh, the new surgeon general, or even the secretary of HHS. At the end of the day, it's the management of the science. And I don't mean by that, um, that we have to tell the scientists what to do, but it's the management of the healthcare system and making certain that supplies, that the supply line is smooth so that we get whatever the healthcare system needs out there. That is the responsibility of the federal government. What we've seen is states taking a leadership role um, because the federal government has failed to send clear messages. Close the country down. India has just closed down. There's no excuse that individual governors are making their own decisions. And in the case of our governor in Florida, he won't make a decision. Uh, in fact, he said the other day he didn't like ordering people around. I don't know why he ran for governor if he didn't like ordering people around, um, uh, particularly for an executive position. But uh, it requires clear leadership and management leadership uh, from the central administration, in this case, our federal government, because otherwise you get uneven approaches across the country. And all those places that have weak governors are going to see tremendous spikes. They're gonna be so far behind. We're already behind as a country, but uh, the unevenness of uh, leadership around the country, um, I know we have a federated system and I know the governors have certain authorities, but all of them are looking to the federal government. And we simply, we've had clear science, but we have not had clear management and clear leadership and clear decisions on essentially closing us down because what we need to do is to starve this virus, literally starve it. And the only way to do that is both to tell people to stay home, to close down uh, businesses, and, and to make sure, of course, we do some of the low tech public health things like wash our hands and, and clean surfaces. We haven't had enough discussion in my judgment about cleaning surfaces. One of the things we found out after people, people came off the ships of the cruise lines that were Petri dishes is that the surfaces themselves uh, kept the coronavirus for at least a week or so. And, uh, uh, that tells us something about the kinds of things we need to do. So, Steve, let me end there, and I'd be ha happy to answer questions. So, uh, again, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to turn it over, first of all, to uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Dean in terms of questions she might have. Okay, I actually pre-collected some questions from my students prior to this, so I'll ask one that came up actually in a few, few emails from students. Um, we have a lot of students who are in, obviously, the medical industry and are worried about the lack of uh, PPE uh, or protective equipment. And so what do you think the government should be doing? I know you were talking about, of course, there's now federal funding going there, but there's also a supply shortage, which the funding can't necessarily yeah. solve. Uh, so do you know what is happening or what you think should be happening? Because that's a big question we got from a number of students. What is finally happening this week is what should have happened three months ago when we saw the breakout uh, in uh, China. Uh, finally, um, the administration has put one person in charge. I think he's an admiral. And he actually is cutting deals with suppliers all over the world. So um, getting protective equipment, getting swabs, uh, uh, getting machines, whatever's necessary, that's just starting to happen. And then they're making the decision about the distribution focusing on New York, obviously, and California and Washington State initially, but they better start focusing on us too, because many of our hospitals only have three or four days in terms of protective equipment. Um, and that includes masks and other things. Most of us are getting calls from people. For example, someone called me today and said that they could repurpose their manufacturing in Hialeah. Uh, what they do is they make the steel frames for uh, elevators and they could repurpose them um, uh, uh, to anything that uh, the government might need and who should they call. So I actually knew who they should call. And, and in my district is Bacardi. Bacardi is repurposing three of its um, uh, liquor uh, facilities uh, in Kentucky, in Florida, and in Puerto Rico to 
to provide uh, um, sanitation, uh, the alcohol for sanitation. Um, and so um, it actually, it will be 70% because that's what they have. So they're not gonna make rum or other kinds of alcohol. They're actually um, uh, going to play another role and they're gonna donate the stuff in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think they'll sell the other things, but they're gonna donate. That is true of many of the liquor companies around the country, um, including uh, others that are here in Florida. They're repurposing because we have not been able to get certain kinds of things. Uh, now, that's happening without the President of the United States invoking a military order that was actually used during World War II to tell companies they had to do this. Great, thank you. So there's a lot going on, but it's months late from my point of view. I'll go ahead and jump in with, um, with some of the questions on, on our end from our students, Dr. Shalala. Um, the one is just from a leadership perspective. I saw in your prior interview, and, and I just told class earlier today, that there has been a huge gap in leadership, as well as conflicting messages, whether or not there should be a federal stay-in-place uh, order. Um, that's trickled down. City Miami has a stay-in-place order. The Miami-Dade County mayor does not. Uh, so, you know, living in Miami, it depends on which zip code you're in, um, if you're uh, in a stay-in-place order or not. Um, but back to leadership. Where do you feel that you would be the most powerful? So you have significant knowledge and expertise on this issue where so many people simply don't. Do you feel like your voice would have been more powerful at this point if you were still HHS secretary? Or is your voice more powerful in Congress when you can inform members of Congress about uh, what needs to be included in the legislation? Well, there are actually different roles. Um, yes, as HHS secretary, hopefully, I wouldn't have to deal with Donald Trump, who doesn't believe in science, obviously. Um, uh, but it would have been a different uh, would have been a different president. Yes, in an executive role, you have far more power, and particularly to take the science to translate it, because that's what the Secretary of HHS does: translate it in a way in which we can change behavior. Um, H one N one. At the University of Miami, we taught everybody to wash their hands. We even had the hand sanitizers in co the commencement line. And uh, they still do that, I think, uh, have hand sanitizers all over the place. But um, obviously, in this situation, the HHS secretary could be very powerful as long as he had a straight line or he or she had a straight line uh, to the president. That's an executive role. In terms of Congress, my strength is I know whether something can work. It's not, I don't have to uh, double team people on the science, but it's knowing um, after you hear from the scientists what will work and keeping it as simple as possible. What you'll see in the packages we've put together is we've used existing platforms. So when we, when we worried about people's salaries, we enhanced the unemployment insurance program. When we worried about free testing, we enhanced Medicaid, Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, told the private sector they should provide free tests, and then made sure everybody that couldn't get free tests could go to a community health center uh, for tests uh, if they were necessary. So using existing platforms in a crisis is something that you learn how to do um, when you're at the federal level, but also in Congress, I could urge people not to reinvent the wheel, but to fill in the gaps and to add resources uh, where we could. Getting some interesting questions from our chat area. I'm gonna read one of them. Uh, given that the assisted living facilities are basically a hotbed, unfortunately, for the uh, outbreak. Um, I oversee an assisted living, facil assisted living facilities, plural. I'm all for placing money in people's pocket that have been affected, especially if they're sick. My problem is I have healthcare workers that are asymptomatic and rather call out because they know they will get paid regardless. This made the operation extremely difficult to manage. So the concept of, of staffing right now in healthcare institutions where the staff themselves feel that they are at significant risk. Yeah, and that's why protective equipment I think is very important. And um, uh, you know, we're totally dependent on the staffing, not simply on doctors and nurses, but all the other people that work in assisted living facilities, in nursing homes, in hospitals, 
and there have been calls for people to come out of retirement. And uh, fundamentally, we have to depend on people's um, uh, sense that, of responsibility in these cases. And, and no one's going to be paid that hasn't been either fired or laid off um, or furloughed. Uh, a number of companies that have had to close, restaurants, for example, are furloughing people so they could keep people. And we've made sure that the unemployment compensation will cover them when they're furloughed. Uh, but I don't, uh, you know, we've got sick leave in this country, but um, healthcare is very much about um, taking reasonable risks. And we've just got to make sure that people stay employed but to do that we have to make sure they feel safe and that's where protective gear is so important um, uh, in these in these relationships dr french do you have questions i have a lot sure more. yes uh, uh i just want to thank dr shalala for doing this taking uh, time away from the schedule uh, it's great to see you uh via, via video uh, unfortunately not in person but um in in our classes uh, given uh, that I teach health economics, we're fixated with the numbers, and uh, and the students want to know what what do we have good information on and what is missing, and I tell them that one thing that we surely know is this is a very infectious and easily transmittable virus. Uh, it, it's spreading very quickly around the world, but what we don't really have a good handle on is what the true infection rate is, uh, because so many people are asymptomatic or have very mild conditions or told not to get a test. Uh, but the testing rate, uh, the, the true positives is really critical to understand how dangerous the virus is. And if you take two to five, two to four percent fatality rate just by the true positives or by the uh, confirmed positives, then we could have several million people dying. But if you take uh, what other studies are showing or at least uh, modeling, showing that this actually might be a much, orders of magnitude higher uh, infection rate than what we actually see as confirmed positives, then it, the mortality rate actually could be equivalent to or less than the common flu. Clearly, uh, those different extremes require different responses. Uh, I'm wondering whether that, those issues are being discussed in Congress and how you all are grappling with those. They are, um, but we're taking what we know. We know that certain parts of the population are more vulnerable. So we've got to take our resources and focus on that population. That may give us skewered information about the total population, but we don't have time to do anything other than focusing on uh, those that are really at risk, including people that have complications uh, from other diseases that have weakened immune systems. Um, yes, there are projections being done, all of them by the federal government. Obviously, the CDC is spending a lot of time uh, trying to figure out the trajectories. Um, and you can see them when, um, when Andrew Cuomo does his uh, presentations, you can see that they're trying to measure the peaks in New York. Because, because we haven't had enough testing and because it's so e uneven across the country, all we can do now is to do some projections. We're not even, we haven't even caught up with the people we currently need to test um, in nursing homes and in other places. So we're way behind in our ability to build sophisticated models to figure out uh, um, what we need to do. We simply need to make sure that, that every part of the healthcare system has the supplies that they need for a significant amount of time so that we can handle and get everybody to stay at home so that we can handle what we have. Meanwhile, as you well know, um, clinical trials have already started. In fact, Mount Sinai is already uh, uh, trying some new approach. Mount Sinai in New York is already trying some new approaches that have to do with antibodies um, derived from people that uh, have the disease. So there's a lot of work being done on treatment, but we're just, we haven't even caught up on supplies. And so it's hard um, uh, to figure out what the model's going to be that's going to give us very precise information. 
here's what we do know. It's going to spread across the country. Mm -hmm. and remember, I remember at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, it was the two West Coasts. Within two years, it was all over the place. So we do know that, but we don't know a lot about the disease. Um, I just mentioned the surfaces. Um, you know, we know, we know something about how it's transmitted from person to person with droplets and things, but it's also surfaces. And those cruise lines that still had surfaces that were infected, um, that hasn't been fully investigated, even though we're telling everybody that we need a lot of sanitation. You know, we're back to sanitation, which was the beginning of public health. We're back to the basics. Wash your hands, sanitize surfaces, um, make sure you have a clean water supply. I mean, uh, literally, we're back to the fundamentals of public health to protect people. One of the discussions that our faculty have been having over coffee initially while we're in the offices and now through, um, through Zoom is the question of the unintended consequences of dealing the way we're dealing. We talked about the economic part, but we're also talking about the healthcare part because elective surgeries and elective is now becoming a broader concept have been put off. One of my family members, for example, was supposed to have elective surgery this week. That had to be called off. But the surgeon in his discussion with that family member also indicated that he was having to put off also cancer surgeries right now. And we also are hearing from our local press that potentially even transplant surgeries are being put off that might mean uh, significant consequences. So these are, so the question is, how does one deal with all of these issues that perhaps were not intended in terms of those um, outcomes? You know, you call Ken Goodman and yes. tell him to talk to your class. Ken Goodman heads the ethics program uh, that covers the medical school because what you're asking me is not an economic question or a public health question. You're asking me an ethical question. What do you put off in the midst of a pandemic? Um, and I would be very uncomfortable if I headed to hospital putting off necessary surgeries. It's one thing to say un unnecessary surgeries, um, but, uh, or at least uh, things that don't have to be done right away. But when you're talking about cancer or transplants, with transplants, you can't wait very long. You can't allow the patient to get sicker uh, because then they won't be eligible for the transplant. So um, one of the things I, I ought to recommend to you is that in the midst of all this discussion, that one of your next speakers ought to be Ken Goodman, that you ought to get Ken, um, or there are others, uh, as you well know, um, uh, but, but part of this discussion is an ethical discussion. I think the president saying that we got to get the economy going again, uh, and that we ought to have everybody out by Easter is a violation of ethical rules. I think it's unethical given the science. Uh, I know of, of no code that says that you ought to exchange the economy for human life. So I actually think when he said that, that it was social Darwinism. I mean, that he, that we knew that people would die if he did that. Um, and so it's not only the selection of what surgeries you're going to do, it's, it's also the decisions, the administrative decisions you make on when we go back to work. So I think these are big ethical questions that um, there's a whole field, as you well know, of medical ethics um, that, uh, that need to be explored. And that's a really good point. I take pride in, having, in saying that I hired um, Dr. Goodman back about 25 yeah, years. I actually called him myself the other day. And I periodically will call Dr. Goodman when I'm dealing with a, a dilemma. When yeah. I saw the president do what he did, and that is say we're going to be back for Easter, I actually called Ken Goodman and said, Ken, this is unethical for him to do this, knowing that people, when the scientists are telling him it's too early, people will die. Look at Hong Kong. They went back too early and it was a disaster. 
Yeah, Ken is one of the premier ethicists in the in the world, actually. So I think the concept of a follow up Zoom call, much like this, for our students might be very interesting, and we will definitely discuss that. Uh, Dr. Dean, uh, additional questions that you might have, and then I want to read a couple of the questions that are coming from the chat room. Sure, I can read some more uh, questions I got preemptively from students, if that's okay. Please, I did have a number of questions on actually the move to telehealth, so that's another thing that came up multiple times and. Uh, what do you think, I guess, one of the questions is really, how do you think that's going to work in terms of HIPAA? Do you see it being something that can help us get through the pandemic, especially because we don't know how long, you know, that will go through? Is that something that's been discussed more locally or at Congress? So they really just want some more information on your thoughts on, on kind of the move to telehealth right now. You know, I think that the, one of the good things, the only good thing I can think of that's going to come out of the pandemic is telehealth. Um, that actually it's not only our ability to expand our capacity um, in um, health institutions, it's really going to be telehealth because, and we put some money in for telehealth in our bill yeah. uh, because we were well aware that, and, and we've worked through the reimbursement with Medicare and Medicaid um, and with the Affordable Care Act because we're very much aware that telehealth is, has matured to the point where this is exactly the situation that will move it to a different level. So that was very much part of our discussion in Congress. That's a very good question. What's your next question for your students? <laughs> uh, I did have another, uh, a few students actually comment on hoarding and it's kind of a little bit outside of some of the traditional health system questions, but of course affects day to day, not just medical supplies, but also just supplies people need to live. So is there anything, I mean, I guess one of the questions, is there anything being done or thought about at Congress, either to expand supplies or, you know, to limit? And I know that might not be something that's in your, you know, in the well, overall- it depends on what kind of hoarding you're talking about. Right. Um, the administration has made it very clear that it is um, a crime if you hoard supplies and you're a scientific or a healthcare institution. Right. But individual hoarding, I still can't figure out the toilet paper. Thing. Sure. <laughs> I, could, I, I went to the, I don't need toilet paper, but I was just astounded as I walked through the aisles that the toilet paper was gone. I guess people are willing to give up everything except their toilet paper. Um, I don't think we're ever going to arrest someone uh, for toilet paper. In fact, the Attorney General of the United States said that that hoarding toilet paper is not on our list. Um, but this has to do with individual responsibility for the collective. This is, uh, this is another ethical question. This is yeah. a question, and I had a, a lot of people at the beginning of this said, we need three months supplies of our drugs. Um, and so people wanted to get a supply. And my concern was that we would, um, that the supply chain would break if everybody got, you know, three or six months uh, worth of their drugs. Right now, most of us get a month or so, maybe even two months, but um, I, I think we have to be careful about these things and public health has to think them through in terms of how it am impacts others. And we as individuals have to think it through. But again, this is one of those ethical questions. Do I take care of me and my family? Or do I worry about uh, uh, the people in my community? Right, and of course it's different when you're talking insulin versus toilet paper, so. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'll, let, I'll pass off questions to someone else. Thank you, this has been. Martin. Been so I'm gonna synthesize some of the questions that are popping up, but also um, sort of, sort of two-pronged. Um, you've mentioned the piece of legislation that Congress is voting on, hopefully, as we speak. Um, we know it includes $130 billion for hospitals. Uh, but some of the questions on the sidebar are sort of asking, and you said there's, well, there'll be several more bills. So this is dealing with the right now, right? We've got to fix what's happening, get money to hospitals, uh, sort of jumpstart the economy in terms of putting money in people's pockets. But for longer term, so for example, with public health, we see that gun sales are skyrocketing in Miami-Dade. This may not have implications for right now when everyone is at home, but six months from now, when a lot of people have access to guns that didn't have access to guns before, is Congress thinking about these things in the next pieces of legislation, the longer term? 
we're certainly, I don't think we're thinking about the next pieces of legislation because we've already done and the Senate will pay no attention. We're thinking about things that are bipartisan, basically. And um, unfortunately, we've done the background checks, we've closed the loopholes, uh, we want to vote on assault weapons ban, but um, I don't think we can get bipartisan support on that. So our thinking is, um, some of it's laying out what we think is important for the next administration, but um, right now we're dealing with an emergency. So we're stepping ahead uh, to think about what the next piece is. I think the next piece is coverage. Because while we've covered free testing, we have not covered um, people's, cover, uh, people's healthcare coverage. So um, there's a, going to be a big gap. One of the reasons we're putting money into the hospitals is we know that they're going to have coverage problems and coverage gap. But we have not said if you get coronavirus, your health care is covered, no matter what kind of health insurance plan you have. The Republicans would not do that. Even though for the first time they were voting on things that they never even believed in, whether it was family leave or, or uh, unemployment insurance, um, uh, or giving money uh, the way we did, or delaying uh, some of the cuts to the health care system, uh, arguing with them over coverage. Um, we did get coverage of a vaccine if it comes online, but it's coverage of a treatment, which is part of a health care stay that we simply are going to have some big gaps in. And that means we're going to either have to put money directly into the health care system or we're going to have to argue again um, that people that don't have insurance or have lousy insurance uh, with the, which they sponsored um, these junk plans that we've got to figure out a way to cover people. There's a question from, uh, as I'm looking at uh, student questions, one of them is uh, from that European experts are indicating that it could be a second peak to this pandemic. Um, and if that occurs, how would Congress react to that given the huge expenditure they just did? toward this concept of the first peak. And also associated with that was, were the estimates done for this situation based on what the numbers are right now or what they're anticipated to be? Those are both, actually, those are two students asking sort of a related questions. Neither. I, I think, Steve, to be honest, um, you avoid the second peak by not going out too early. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the two peaks is what happened in Hong Kong because they went uh, to work too early. So, um, and did we put the money out based on what we think is going to happen? What we were interested in is making sure we didn't go into depression and making sure all the people that we've told to stay home or have been furloughed. The people that work in the hospitals, for the cruise industry, at the airport, everybody that's basically lost their job, lost their employment, we wanted to make sure that they could pay their rent, that they could uh, buy groceries. And so we were putting enough money into the system to almost make them whole for at least four months. Um, and we weren't, I don't think we were thinking about peaks. We were thinking about getting enough money into the healthcare system so that the supply line was smooth enough. But we always knew from the first bill to the second bill to the third bill that there would be a fourth and a fifth bill. We never assumed that we got it right. We'll have a technical fix on this bill that will pass this week. There'll be some technical corrections because the, there'll be drafting errors. Um, but that won't be the fourth bill. Uh, the fourth bill will be whatever the gaps were as we see this unfold and see the other things that we need to do. And I, I think that probably means saving some large industries because uh, we put a half a billion dollars, um, half a trillion dollars almost into saving uh, businesses and industry. 
And one question for me before I turn it back over to Dr. French is the question of logistics. So the money has been now set aside to send a gathered physical checks to people around the country. How does that actually get operating? Yeah, well, it's the IRS and Treasury. And they base it, if you haven't filed your 2019 um, taxes, they're going to base it on your 2018 income. So if, you're, uh, if you made under $75,000 in 2018 and you haven't filed your 2019 taxes, you're going to get $1,200 plus, and you're under $75,000 plus $500 for each kid. If you make over $150,000, I think you uh, make under $150,000, you're gonna get a lesser amount of money. But it's the IRS that bases it on your taxes. Uh, but if you're 2000, and, uh, I had the funniest call. One of my cousins, who's an accountant actually, called, he had a child in 2019, and he had heard about the 2018, and he said, how do I get my kid in 2019 covered with the $500. <laughs> and I said, first of all, you make more than $75,000 a year, but if you did, you'd have to file your taxes. And of course, everybody's gotten an extension on their taxes, but that's what the rule is. But, but the IRS will send out the checks. The IRS is the only, only Social Security um, and the IRS send out checks and you know the VA, obviously send out checks in this country through direct deposit. So the IRS will, um, will send out the checks and I think they're gonna do it in the next couple of weeks. I, we wanted to, look, um, most, most Democrats were not as enthusiastic uh, about the sending out checks uh, because there's, um, even though they're targeted, there's a lot of leakage when you do this. I mean, there are a lot of people that look like they make $75,000, but they really didn't. And so um, there's a lot of leakage. I think from a psychological point of view, given that people are running out to buy groceries and that they're at home, that it's not a bad thing to do. Just put some money in people's pockets right away. While meanwhile, they're standing in line to get unemployment insurance, because it's going to take a while for that system and the small business system to ramp up. So, you know, we got to worry about mental health thing at the same time. We've never had so many people at home. Right, Dr. French. Yes, um, so the, the uh, public policy and public health uh, insights you're offering are, are really uh, fascinating, uh, Dr. Shalala. But I'd, I'd like you to put on, your, uh, put on your higher education hat. So uh, the University of Miami, as you know, as well as so many other universities are now engaged in online learning. Uh, I've, I've never done online teaching before and now I'm doing it for three classes and our students are being exposed to it for the first time as well. And so as thinking back to your days as president and we so enjoyed having you walking around campus talking to all of our students, so we really miss that. Um, is this the new wave? In other words, is that our um, are we going to be teaching a whole lot more? Uh, I don't know what the number is, what the percentage is, but do you uh, foresee with all this investment being made in online learning, is this uh, the direction that we're going to be going? I think it's a mixed bag. I think there are still students that want to come to campus, but even in our classes on campus, we're using a lot more technology. Uh, in our teaching and we're interacting with students a lot more using technology. So um, it's been growing for a long period of time. And of course the private sector has run with it and um, uh, with varying degrees of, of quality. Um, I think there'll be a lot of people that, uh, that see this as a way to pull down the cost of higher education. I, I still believe that there's no substitute for human interaction. I don't know how I can write recommendations. Let me think in a very practical way. Uh, I did a couple of recommendations to, uh, today to students that are going to graduate school that were my students. How, how would I get to know them? 
online in the same way that I got to know them in class or even standing after class and chatting with them or having them come to my office. So while I think there'll be more online, I still think the best universities will have a mixture and will continue to use technology because there's so much information out there. Um, we'll continue to use technology um, uh, to at least do a lot more synthesis for us. And uh, even though it's fun to sort of talk to you all, I'd, uh, I'd really rather uh, be in a classroom with you or sitting around having a cup of coffee. Um, and I think there's so much informal learning of students, uh, particularly in our graduate programs, just getting to know other students, hearing their experiences. And I just, I just don't think online does that for us. So it's gonna be a mixture for quality programs. For other people that can only learn online, that is, they don't have an alternative. They need to finish school, they're working full time. Um, uh, we'll have uh, perfected it a lot more. But remember, most of the University of Miami is simply putting their lectures online. They're not doing what you all are doing. They're simply putting their lectures on, online. Um, so they're way behind in, in, in terms of the interaction. But, you know, learning is still done the way, real learning is still done the way they did in Athens. I mean, where they're sitting around with a group of students. So I don't think there's a substitute for that. And I've learned more from those kinds of interactions. Um, and, and so, you know, I just think it's gonna be a mixed bag. And I think we have to be careful to watch it so it doesn't become just this all the time. Thank you. Not that I don't think you're all good at this, but. I think your faculty would agree on that, <laughs> our, our faculty. Uh, a question from a student uh, asked the question about, um, are we gonna be fast tracking discovery of vaccines, what we've been hearing from the scientists is it's an 18 month to two year process to come out with a vaccine. Are we going to take greater risks in terms of developing some of these before they're fully proven to see what works uh, in terms of the situation? No, I just, um, I think safety is still the hallmark of American science. And I think, uh, um, uh, Tony Fauci was very clear about that. Um, and he thinks it's actually, he's talking about 18 months to two years, and that's fast track, Steve. That's a fa fast track process. Look, I'm even upset that a lot of these testing kits and testing devices were approved by the FDA before we had the safety tests. Now, they're supposed to report back in 15 days, but I don't even like that process. But we're faced with that process because we needed to get a lot of tests of different kinds out. Um, and the test probably won't kill people. But the truth is, we, want, we don't want a bunch of false positives. So what the, what the, the, what the companies that have developed the test, these test kits are supposed to do is report back in 15 days after they've looked at their data. Um, now, we are fast-tracking therapies. but they're not really fast tracked as much as we're using old therapies and testing them uh, on this particular disease. But we're also being very careful. What I like about the vaccine, about the, um, uh, about the therapy strategy is that it's really an international effort. And if you, I just read the Mount Sinai thing, which I referred to before, they're actually working with people in other parts of the world who have been uh, doing this for a little while. Um, the Chinese have been doing it. So um, the fact that we're, we're doing international, we're continuing our global uh, science is really important in finding appropriate uh, uh, treatments. Of course, we did that in AIDS and it took us two years just for the therapies. It took us years to develop a therapy with lots of money. Um, I remember a colleague of mine who was doing AIDS research, Howard Temkin, Temin, Howard Temin, the great Nobel laureate at the University of Wisconsin coming into my office one day and he said, do you think they're throwing too much money at AIDS research? He said, they keep 
calling me and telling me I could have more and more money and I don't really need it. You know, he said, I'm, I'm really quite focused. And I said, you know, sometimes overspending, which is what we're doing now, by the way, our strategy is not to underspend, but to overspend because we're not quite sure what will work. Being too timid when you're in the middle of a crisis is, is wrong. And uh, being bold, I think, is extremely important in this kind of situation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dean? I have a related follow-up question, actually. So uh, in terms of a market for a vaccine, especially for pandemics, we often see that there really isn't an economic market right? Because the pandemics come and go, or think about something like Ebola. So what role, I mean, is the government current, currently playing in making kind of a, a market for this uh, a corona, va corona uh, vaccine? And do you think there's anything else the government should be doing on that front? We absolutely are going to make a market. And we're going to, we've already announced we are, we're going to make a market. And that is, we've made a market for testing because we've made it free, which means Medicare and Medicaid and the government programs have made a market. And we've told the insurance companies, figure out a way, but the testing uh, has to be free. We're gonna do the same thing uh, with a treatment or a vaccine. There will be a market. We did that in AIDS with a huge international investment, particularly through PEPFAR, uh, by the United States. And for the students that are watching uh, the press conferences with the president, um, Dr. Burks ran PEPFAR for many years and is a military, actually was a military officer. I think she was a colonel. Um, but uh, we created a market, got a huge discount from those that provided uh, uh, the vaccines, not the vaccines, but the treatment. Uh, for AIDS um, in, um, uh, by creating a market, we could negotiate a huge discount on the prices, which is exactly what we'll do in this case. And every country in the world will participate. Great, thank you. Now, in other cases, we did in fact drop Ebola, those other cases. Those were more targeted to certain parts of the country. Mm -hmm. That was unfortunate because we really needed, and we've made a billion dollar investment in the creation of vaccines, but we need to keep going on these vaccines. Look, we can't get every American to sign up for their flu shots. And we've, uh, we're, we've invested in a universal flu shot. And hopefully, um, as opposed to the CDC making a guess every year, not a, it's a scientific guess, Hopefully, we'll get someplace with that as well. Dr. Mortensen, question? Yes, so I can see Dr. Shalala, one of your former students, Simi, one of our University of Miami physicians, is asking if you became president today and assumed that role and could sort of make up for lost time, what are some immediate decisions you would make right now to, to address this pandemic? I closed down the country. I basically closed out. I tell everybody to stay home for two weeks. Um, just go home for two weeks. We'll pay your salaries. Just go home for two weeks. And um, uh, I mean, we just have to make these kinds of uh, decisions and we can't be meek about it. I call all the governors and tell them what I was going to do. Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, I just get this distribution system of what we need uh, going even faster. And I'd invoke um, uh, the defense uh, bill that we've all been yelling about and tell, geez, now starting, but to tell every industry in the country, this is what we need you to do to reprogram um, uh, your factories. And I'd go to the auto industry, I'd go to every manufacturing that we had, and then I would develop a worldwide strategy because there are other places um, that are producing masks and not just a worldwide strategy focused on the United States. The third thing I would do is I would bring, even though it sounds um, like the opposite, but the development of drugs and the manufacture of drugs in the United States is too dependent 
in an emergency on a country like China. And it's only chemistry we're talking about. So the ingredients that go into drugs, I think we've got to have a way in the United States of ramping up in case we have to produce our own. And so uh, we ought to support the development of that industry, not because I wanna put China out of business, but because if China's sick, then we don't have the supply chain we need for the creation of drugs. So those are probably the three things I would do and I would start doing fireside chats the way Franklin Roosevelt did. And I actually have a fireplace. I have one of the few people in Florida that has a fireplace. We have one also. <laughs> yeah. Donna for president. <laughs> exactly. Um, Michael, do you have a question? Uh, just a, a, a quick one, sort of a, a follow-up to uh, a national lockdown. Uh, so the, since we don't have a vaccine, the only way to actually develop uh, immunity from this is to catch the, uh, the virus and self-recover. Um, and I guess the question is, more and more of those people uh, become um, available to actually return to work. Should we allow those who actually uh, test positive, recover, and develop uh, antibodies, should we selectively allow those people to return and service parts of the economy? I don't know how you do that because it could be one person for one shop here and another person for another shop uh, over here. So I don't, I think that's difficult to do unless you tell me that everybody that works at Cafe Milano in, um, in Miami uh, has had the disease, is immune now, and can go to work. Um, but, you know, some people will and some people won't. So I think that's very difficult to do. I, and, and public health has never had a strategy like that, um, where some people uh, went to work and some people uh, didn't. I do think we have to find a treatment. And, and while everybody has said you simply can't get the disease again. Um, they haven't said it with the kind of sure, uh, uh, secure, given me a kind of secure feeling about that. Mm -hmm. um, they dodge around it a little bit. They think so, uh, but we haven't lived with the disease long enough. And so I would worry um, uh, again about the transmitter. But there's nothing in public health that suggests that you can do this selectively given the way this disease is spread. So I think it's hard to do. I think it's very hard to do. How would you do it at the University of Miami with the faculty? So the faculty that went back got to teach their classes to the students that had already had the disease. I mean, mechanically, um, it's not even, uh, going into the ethical questions. I just don't see how you could do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's an interesting question here. There are a lot of interesting questions. Uh, this is potentially ethical, but it's also, I think, potentially policy-wise. And that's the anti-vaxxers, anti uh, those who are against having vaccines. So assuming that we do find in the next 18 months a, uh, a vaccine that helps, uh, that basically uh, stops this from circulating, but because of the herd immunity aspects, you need to have enough people who are taking it, and especially because this one is so contagious. If you had people who would say, who say, I'm against having vaccines for myself and my family, how, or communities that say that, what policy aspects does one undertake in those kinds of situations? Well, you can see what we just did with measles. Mm -hmm. um, States could, could insist that people get, you can't go to school unless you uh, have had the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, or you can't be, uh, uh, use your Medicaid um, in a nursing home unless you're willing to take the vaccine. I mean, there are all sorts of levers that government has uh, to get enough people to take the vaccines, mm -hmm. let alone letting them free. Now. The problem that we have is in the flu vaccine, we haven't used all those levers. Though, if you go to a nursing home, they make sure you have a flu shot and a pneumonia shot. 
uh, you don't have a lot of people coming out of uh, uh, nursing homes, uh, going to emergency rooms that have the flu. A lot of people get pneumonia mm -hmm. because that's an end of life disease, even if they've had the pneumonia shot. But um, we have some levers to develop uh, those herds. And we would, uh, given the fear that now exists, and by the way, I think fear is a virus. And I'm very concerned about the president's language um, uh, about all of this. So um, I, just, I, I just think we have some levers to get that done. With, um, this is my question now. And with universities can require people have the shot before they come. And uh, as you well know, we've urged all the faculty to get their flu shots, but medical schools and, and um, hospitals have demanded that people get their flu shots. You can't work unless you get your flu shots. So a question also, we've spoken about the, the free testing and you said that Medicare or Medicaid would pick that up, but there's also the uh, testing and ultimately the treatment for those who are uninsured with 35 million people right now in the United States uninsured and many other millions who are underinsured. Right. How does this system absorb if we have this very significant uh, number of people who end up on the high cost ICU beds and ventilators? How do we absorb those costs? Well, that's, we actually, in our bill, we absorb those costs. We could not convince the Republicans for the treatment costs. Um, free testing will take place across this country if, and uh, a testing site is being set up now at Marlin Stadium for people that have symptoms and for people in certain uh, age groups, obviously, people that are at risk and for healthcare providers. Um, if, if you don't have health insurance, you can go to a federally qualified health center. We have 21 of them in Miami-Dade. So we have ways of getting everybody tested. The problem is treatment. And um, Democrats are going to insist that treatment is covered. Uh, otherwise, the hospitals are going to absorb um, these populations. We put some money into the hospitals to handle exactly that. But and I have a sense the Republicans would rather give money to the healthcare system than say to the insurance, I mean, take the insurance route. So uh, they're still anti the government role in insurance. And I think they, they still think we're all moving towards uh, Medicare for all. <clears throat> so my sense is that we're going to keep giving money. If I was to guess on the politics, we're gonna fight like hell to get insurance to cover this all free, the treatment's free, but we may end up just giving money to the healthcare system. Everybody's gonna get a dish payment. Uh, Dr. Dean? Sure, there's another question here that's coming up somewhat consistently in the chats, and it's uh, to get your insights on to expanding malpractice regulations, uh, especially as we don't know a lot, of course, about the new virus. And so people are trying using old therapies for you know, this, this new disease, and uh, there's been this change to telehealth. So if you had any insights on that. Uh, yeah, we just, uh, we just let all the people that were um, creating um, uh, some of the supplies off the hook in terms of indemnifying them. But look what we're indemnifying. People that make masks, uh, people that make swabs, I mean, we're indemnifying them. The federal government can do that. Unfortunately, the issue of indemnification and torts is very much a state issue, and I've been fighting it over the years. I'm one of the few Democrats. Um, that uh, actually is on the side of, uh, of protecting uh, healthcare workers um, in their decisions, uh, not in their criminal decisions. But um, the big push now is people that are in uh, emergency rooms. And lots of emergency room physicians have been writing to uh, the media um, and describing situations in which they have to make judgment calls about who gets tests, who doesn't get tests, uh, who's admitted to hospital beds, who's not admitted to 
hospital uh, beds and, and they wanna be protected, uh, but that's a state decision. Um, Republicans actually like uh, 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 some of this, but uh, the constitution in Florida makes it difficult to do. We did a little bit when we protected UM doctors uh, when they were working at a public hospital. Uh, but um, it's a state by state decision. Uh, the states have the authority um, over these decisions, but it's uh, those that are going to do triage are going to feel like they're going to be particularly at risk. And uh, uh, states are going to have to think this through. People at the federal level are thinking it through, but every time we've tried to do something at the federal level, even for Medicare and Medicaid, where we put our own money in, uh, we lose the cases because it's a state responsibility. Sergeant Martinson. So uh, I just want to push a little bit on that comment you said about getting money to, to healthcare systems and hospitals as opposed to individuals. So we're learning now that the CDC made what seems to be a series of mistakes in the way that they allocated the testing kits, sort of an equal approach. Each state gets 100 kits and distributes as they see fit. So your sister in North Dakota could have walked in symptom free and gotten a test. Whereas here in Miami, we have a lot of people who are symptomatic but don't meet the right criteria. With your new, the new bill going through in, in Congress, will they make sure that these funds are allocated to the hospitals that are being hit the hardest? Or is this sort of more of an equitable um, across the board allocation of those funds? Well, that was the public allocation of the funds in terms of testing kits. Uh, what happened after that was they opened up the commercial uh, people so that they could provide uh, uh, testing and, um, and purchase uh, testing kits. So when, once they opened up the commercial, then it was up to uh, the different parts of the healthcare system to just start using the commercial sets. Um, the CDC is not set up for universal testing. It was never set up for universal testing. The CDC is tested, is strength is their diagnostics, uh, discovering what the disease is. And while it has some testing, has a big testing site, it's not set up to take care of every state. So they got some of the original kits out, but after that, um, the government has, in fact, on the stuff that it's acquired and what it has in its warehouses, sending it to places that really need it, uh, the epicenters, New York, California, uh, Washington, and increasingly Florida, I believe. Dr. French? So it's been a mess. Wow, this is but a I, I wouldn't fault the CDC. I think they were slow in terms of developing their own test, but the U.S. always develops its own test. Uh, yeah, this is a treat to have the uh, opportunity to ask so many questions. Uh, so I want to push on your comment a little bit earlier about uh, if you were making the decision, you should have a national lockdown. Um, some states have already come out and said that if President Trump decides to restart the economy by Easter, they're going to defy that order and they're going to uh, keep their state locked down, New Jersey, New York, California. If we had a national lockdown, States like Texas and Wyoming and Idaho, Montana would probably defy that order. So um, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'm curious how that would play out in either direction. Uh, do our states really just free to do what they want or do we have to band together as a nation and one for all and all for one? Well, we should band together as a nation. The federal government does have some levers mm -hmm. uh, to change states behavior because it has all sorts of resources that it gives to the states. But let me give you an example. So uh, my um, sister lives in North Dakota. Uh, my nephew is a farmer in North Dakota. He is, he's about to go into spring planting. So he is not gonna lock down in rural North Dakota. Uh, but the state might lock down and make certain exceptions for farmers that are doing spring planting in, in rural areas. So the lockdown is very important in urban areas, extremely important in urban areas, because that's where we've seen a lot of the uh, transmission. So it would be a national lockdown, but I'm sure that there would be some exceptions, particularly as we're going into 
into spring planting. But everybody's going to, first of all, there's coronavirus all over the country. Every state has it. So this is about leadership. This is about the president saying the only way we're going to get this done is if we starve this disease and all of us need to stay home for 15 days. Uh, but, you know, the, the 2,000 farmers in North Dakota in isolated areas that only see family members and have a couple of workers, you can do your spring planning. But don't travel to Wyoming <laughs> and get infected. So, you know, there are ways of administering a national uh, program. And there are levers. Again, the federal government has to use its levers to get people to change their behavior. But Florida needs to lock down. But Florida farmers in Homestead need to pick the tomatoes. But we can lock down and pick tomatoes. Yep. I think we have time for one more question. And I want to see who gets their question in first of our three other of our three professors. So it's a toss up. None of you? I think the youngest ought to go first. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. Emma, you get one more question, and then when I have ask for I, some I feel like I asked most of mine. I've been over asking over here. If someone else has a pressing one, please. Um, Carolyn, you got one from one of your students? Well, how about just uh, leave this on a positive note? What are your words for hope and, and encouragement through very, very challenging time, particularly for our students who were about to have a whole lot of fun the end of their senior year and um, all that was taken away from them. How about some words of encouragement for us? You know, um, you will attend, tell your grandchildren that you lived through this and particularly students in, in healthcare. This is the most fascinating uh, time um, in the history uh, of American healthcare. So this is an opportunity to learn. And for the first time, you have teachers on television, as well as your classroom teachers, that can, uh, that can, uh, that can bring this understanding together. I mean, this is, for those of us who are interested in health policy and in public health, it's a fascinating time. We're going to get through this, but you're going to learn about a number of things. You're going to learn about public health. You're going to learn about how legislatures can respond. You're gonna learn about a lot about leadership and what a difference leadership makes. And you're gonna learn how science continues and can get its arms around something so complex. Um, this is both complex and simple. Look, look at what we're doing. We're using fancy machines when people get really sick and we're telling everybody to wash their hands. Mm -hmm. We're going from low tech to high tech, and and that's healthcare in this world, and it's a global pandemic. So it also teaches you that diseases know no boundaries, and that there's no way to close up a country because it's going to spread. Uh, but boy, are we going to learn a lot as 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 we go through uh, what is a serious and terrible and life and death uh, experience. But I couldn't, um, I couldn't be more proud of all of you that have chosen to go into healthcare. Um, uh, this is the time to go into healthcare. This is a time when you're going to, uh, when you're just gonna blossom. And you've got some, uh, you've got four of the best professors I know. So congratulations to all of you. I just wanna say, you have to understand, this is the former secretary of HHS. This is the former, our current congresswoman and our former president of the university who's just spent now almost an hour and a half with us with everything else she is going on. Uh, that's a credit to you all students, but I could not be, I don't think our faculty could be more thankful for the time you just took today. We well, it was fun. Thanks, Steve. Invite me again. You'll, Thank you'll you. Get that Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalala. Oh, you're welcome.